And I think perhaps we should get started. So thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, this is our take two of session nine. So this is session 9B. Uh, my name is Ben Margulet um, and I'm very happy to, to host this session, um, to share it. So first off, uh, we have uh, Shivani Bandari will tell us exciting uh, new results about host galaxies of one-off and repeating FRBs. Um, so, Giovanni, if you're ready, you can take it away. Okay, thanks, Ben. Uh, try to share my screen. As a reminder to everyone, please post your questions um, in the Q and A, and I'll uh, read them out. Um, and uh, if there's our collaborators for people who have pre-recorded talks, uh, please, uh, if you're willing, just raise your hand uh, or uh, or speak up, and and uh, you'll be able to. I'll allow you to speak and answer these questions. All right, go ahead, Giovanni. Okay, thanks. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Shivani Bhandari. I'm postdoctoral fellow at CSRO. And today I'm going to talk about FRV host population. So this work was done in close collaboration with the RealFast, Craft, and F4 teams. Uh, paper describing the results is submitted to AppJ, and it's up on archive. So I will start off by introducing three new FRB localization and their host galaxies. So with these new observations and including some of the published FRB host data, I will then compare this larger host galaxy sample with the underlying field galaxy population. Um, following that, I will present a differential analysis of the host galaxies of two apparent FRB source population. Uh, I will then compare the global properties of FRB host with that of extragalactic transients, and also compare FRB host, um, FRB offset distributions with galactic sources and globular clusters in late type and early type galaxies. So let's dive in. Uh, we have heard a lot about FRB 180301 quite a few times in this conference now. This FRB was originally detected by the Parkes Radio Telescope, and then later in a sensitive follow-up observation with FAST, it was observed to emit 15 repeating bursts. So to localize this burst, we conducted a follow-up campaign with the VLA Real Fast system in L-band and were successful in catching the source during action. So a repeating burst from this FRB source was um, initially detected at a signal to noise of 19 in the real fast 10 millisecond image at a DM of 536 DM units, of which uh, Milky Way ISM contribution is about 152 and the DM contribution due to the IGM and foreground halos, which we call DM cosmic or DM excess is estimated to be 289. So the burst is localized with a precision of less than an arc second, and it's observed to come from the outskirts of this star forming galaxy at a redshift of 0.33. Uh, the plot here shows the G band um, Gemini image. The association is pretty secure with a path posterior probability of 99.9%. If you want nitty gritty details about the localization and astrometry, please ping me on Slack. Uh, here, I'm mostly gonna concentrate on the properties of host galaxies. So moving forward, um, next FRB uh, was 191228, which, which was discovered uh, during craft observation with ASCAP um, at 1.2 gigahertz. It has a DM of about 298 parsec per centimeter cubic and uh, offline interferometric analysis led to the localization of this burst. And guess what? The FRB sightline seemed to accompany this lonely star form and halt. So thanks to the heroic efforts of our colleagues within our collaboration, um, we were able to get rid of most of the glare from this star and saw the host for the very first time in the VLT Forest 2 images. Uh, we are again confident about this association with the path probability of 100%. So the FRB was again observed to come from the uh, outskirts of this host galaxy. Uh, spectroscopy from Keck um, confirmed the redshift of this FRB to be about 0.24. Um, the galaxy has a stellar mass of about uh, 5%. 0.4 times 10 to the power nine solar masses and a very low star formation rate of about 0.03 solar masses per year. 
Um, next in our sample is FRB 200906, which was again an, at, an ASCAP detection. Uh, we found it with a signal to noise of 19 at a DM of um, 578 with an estimated DM cosmic of 324. Um, uh, we localized this burst uh, with an accuracy of about half an arc second in this case. So the host galaxy was uh, initially identified in PANSTARS, and uh, then we followed it up by deeper observations with the VLT, and here's an I-band image of that. So no big bright stars in the way this time. Um, the galaxy is an order of magnitude massive than the previous ones, and star formation rate is about half solar masses per year. Uh, so combining these new observations of um, FRB host with published data, uh, we accumulated a sample of about 16 FRBs uh, with secure host association. So we uh, followed a, a criteria where we take uh, uh, FRB and its host if the path probability of the association is greater than 90%. So we also include the repeating FRB in M81 and the ASCAP FRB um, 17, 10, 20 due to their low probability of chance associations. So uh, for our final host sample, uh, it consisted of six repeating and 10 non-repeating fast radio bursts. The highlighted one are the one that repeats. Okay, so uh, then we compare this FRB host population with the underlying galaxy from the primus data for galaxies which have redshift less than 0.5. So basically is in the same range as that of our fast radio burst sample. So a plot on the left here uh, shows the current star formation as a function of stellar mass. And as you can see that most of the FRB hosts lie in or around this uh, star forming cloud of galaxies, but are offset from this purple line, which is the star forming main sequence for galaxies with similar stellar masses. We also note that Two of the 16 uh, hosts in our sample lie in the region occupied by, uh, occupied by Quezon galaxies. And plot on the right here shows you uh, a color magnitude diagram, and it kind of provides uh, information about the overall stellar population in these galaxies. So uh, the late type galaxies with ongoing star, form, star formation and, and therefore young stellar population lie in this blue cloud zone here. And then uh, while massive early type galaxies live in the red and dead zone, which are characterized by uh, very low star formation and hence older stellar population. So we call them red galaxies. Um, as you can see that the host of FRBs appear um, to lie in the luminous side of the absolute magnitude diagram here, mainly near the blue cloud and the green valley region where galaxies are sort of expected to transition between the star forming and Quezon system. So here is the same color uh, magnitude diagram, but what I've done here, I have taken the primus data, which was plotted in the background, and I've taken a weighted, uh, and I've weighted that data with stellar mass. So where the first plot shows you where most galaxies are, this particular plot is a kind of close approximation of where most stars are in the local universe. Um, and we see that majority of FRB hosts do not trace this red massive galaxies. Uh, and also they do not seem to align with, the, with this peak in the color magnitude diagram for this blue galaxies. Uh, yeah, so to quantify this effect, uh, we examined the null hypothesis that FRB tracks stellar mass, the FRB host tracks stellar masses. So for doing this, we used a double Schechter function to model the galaxy stellar mass function for all the galaxies and then for star forming and for passive galaxies. So we did that for the galaxies in the cosmos data for um, in the redshift range of 0.2 to 0.5. And then we did a weighted cumulative version of this plot. And we compared that with the observed FRB host mass distribution. So that's our FRBs and those are the other galaxies. So our, our case test uh, shows that FRB hosts do not track the stellar mass as their field galaxies. 
Um, next, we tested the null hypothesis that FRB hosts track star formation rates in the local universe. So for this, we use the uh, star formation rate dense, uh, distribution uh, function, which is basically derived from uh, the, the UV and the IR luminosity Schechter functions uh, for the local universe using this Galax data. And um, we then computed the star formation rate density distribution, volume density distribution function here. And again, if, if you take a cumulative sum of this distribution function and compare that with that of FRBs here, our KS test again shows that FRB hosts do not track star formation rate. So we conclude that FRB hosts have lower masses star formation rate than the randomly selected galaxies, which are weighted by their masses and star formation rate. So this implies FRB tracks some other property, which may be yet to be known. Um, also, if FRBs are tracing star formation rate or stellar mass within their host is a different question to ask. And Alex is going to talk about more about that in her presentation next. Uh, yeah. So after that, what we did, we took all our sample and we plotted it on the famous BPT diagram here, where the uh, nuclear emission lines um, ratios are kind of used to uh, determine the dominant source of ionization in the galaxy. And it also distinguishes between the star forming AGN and the liner uh, galaxy regions. So we observed that FRBs are not drawn from a specific class. And uh, we also found that the star formation and liner emission are uh, mostly ionizing sources in the uh, FRB host galaxies. I also note that there are three repeating FRBs and all of those lie in the star forming region, but again, they are not on the star forming sequence here. So moving forward, we then performed a differential analysis of the host populations of repeating and non-repeating FRBs. So we compared their stellar mass, their star formation rates, their projected offsets, absolute magnitudes, uh, specific star formation rate and metallicities. And our KS test um, reveals that there is no statistical significant differences between the host of these apparent population. Uh, as you can see that we got the p-value which is much, much greater than our significance level of 0.05. <laughs> Okay, so then we went on comparing the global properties of FRB host with that of other transients, uh, which include uh, ULX, uh, ultra-luminous X-ray sources, long GRBs, short GRBs, um, core collapse supernovae, superluminous supernovae, and type 1A, uh, which is kind of a proxy for uh, accretion-induced collapse of white dots. So following the method described in Boshin et al, we also correct for the redshift evolution by scaling the stellar masses and the star formation rates of each of these host galaxies uh, to be statistically representative of Z equals uh, zero galaxies. Um, and by doing that, and then comparing the sample, we found FRB host to be statistically indistinguishable from that of core collapse supernova and short GRB hosts. We also uh, found that for ULX and type 1A supernova, the projected offset distributions were uh, found to be consistent, but their host masses and, and their star formation rates are, are more than that of FRB, so they are not similar. Uh, while from the host galaxy con considerations, we could statistically rule out LGRBs and superluminous supernova for all the FRBs combined, we did find some similarities between the repeating FRB host population and the hosts of these transients. Now, these may be because of a smaller sample size or the effect of the host of R1 on the overall repeating FRB host population, because there are only six uh, in our sample. So definitely further investigations are needed to uh, explore this. So few things here I would like to point out. Number one is that uh, one is likely to find an extreme p-values with more KS tests you do. And, and second is, as Sriharsh also pointed out, that for these transients, they assume a dominant channel, which may or may not be true for FRBs. So these are still very early days. 
Okay, so um, looking into our own galaxy and following the work of Triumphs et al., we compare the host normalized offset distributions of a larger sample of FRBs than Triumphs uh, in, in, in their host with our galactic sources in our own Milky Way. So with our KS test, uh, we couldn't reject the null hypothesis that these are drawn from the same underlying distributions, meaning um, they are were consistent with that of FRBs with a confidence of 95%. And finally, um, motivated by the discovery of an FRB in a globular cluster, uh, we compared the host normalized distributions of FRBs with that of globular clusters in both late and early type galaxies. Um, so we used the published globular cluster data associated with spirals such as M81 and M31, and then elliptical galaxies such as NGC 4278 um, and NGC 821. And, and here, uh, this tells us um, like, for example, in M81, most of the globular clusters are less than 100 kiloparsec from the center. So that tells you the maximum uh, host the maximum offset for the globular clusters from the center of that particular galaxy. So here we note that uh, M81 data is mostly dominated by the disk population of globular clusters, where a uh, majority of the clusters are within 10 kiloparsec from the galaxy centers, uh, while for others we do see a mix of disk and, and halo population. So um, with that data, we observe that um, FRB host distribution is mostly statistically not consistent with the offset distribution of the um, GCs with 95 confidence. And um, however, there are some caveats here, such as globular cluster frequency scales with the stellar mass and FRB host population is spanning three or four orders of magnitude in stellar mass. And, and also the current FRB host sample shows a deficiency of elliptical galaxies. So things that still need to keep in mind. Um, much larger sample, definitely of, of precise localized nearby FRBs are required to pursue this study further. So uh, talking about the future, uh, we Hello, are Annie. working. Yes. I'm sorry, just a couple more minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, talking about our future, we are working towards upgrading the current craft system, which does the incoherent sum searches of FRBs at the moment. Uh, the craft coherent upgrade, or what we call it CRACO, will enable fully coherent searches by, by a fast imaging of visibilities. And this is going to make ASCAP five times more sensitive than the current method. Thus, in the coming future, ASCAP will be delivering um, one FRB uh, per day with arc second localizations. And we are excited to announce that we have been awarded 180 hours of VLT time to observe 50 ASCAP localized host galaxies in the coming year. So this project is called Furby and it's led by Ryan Shannon and Casper Hens. So yeah, watch out this space for more host galaxies and interesting stuff. And um, yeah, so I think I'm running out of time. I'll leave you with my conclusions here and happy to take questions. Thanks. Thank you, Shivani. Wow, this was a very, very interesting talk and really nice results, um, super exciting. So we already have some questions. So I think the first question is from Jason. Um, so Jason is asking, you know, great work. Can I summarize your findings as in the context of the magnetar models, do we need magnetized forms via a variety of channels uh, and that they have to be active for a long time? Yeah, yeah. So that's why we are suggesting that there is no one dominant channels to create FRB progenitors or magnetars. We are seeing like a mixture. They can be produced by delayed channel and also with core collapse supernova. So with this sample, because we are not finding many FRB hosts in the red galaxies, so we say that probably it's not dominated by delayed channel but then that FRB in the globular cluster kind of challenges that interpretation. Great. Uh, any more questions, please type away in the chat. Okay, one from Sergei Popov. Um, in the case of well-localized FRBs, uh, can we exclude the possibility that they are not in the identified galaxy itself, but in small satellites like the Magellanic clouds? Right. Yeah, so I think you need uh, that. That's why we need like to localize FRBs in the 
which are nearby so that we can actually see if there is a dwarf galaxy nearby. But with currently deeper observations, we haven't found any dwarf galaxy. So that's why we are pretty sure that these FRBs are coming from um, the host that we think they are coming from. Great. Any additional questions for Shivani? Um, maybe just to add Ben, since I can unmute, I mean, it is quite striking that there are so few, while well, there are basically no hosts really right on the star forming main sequence. Are you really surprised? Like, were you, you know, if I would have asked two or three years ago, would you have expected that FRB hosts would have been, you know, nicely tied to, to the star forming main sequence because they're all very, very young magnetars? Or it's a bit of a surprise to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, if so, we see that their um, properties are consistent with core collapse supernova. So yes, we might have imagined that they are coming from star forming regions, but um, but that's not what we are seeing with the high resolution sample as well. They are not coming from very star forming galaxies, and they are also not coming from the star forming region inside the galaxies. So so that's interesting. And I think definitely we need more data and more nearby localized FRB to investigate that further. Can I ask a quick follow-up? So for the star forming um, background galaxies that you showed or in the star formation mass plane, uh, are those um, Z equals zero galaxies or what, yes. yeah, what sample is that? Okay. Yeah, so that's a galaxy data. So yes, um, Z equals zero local universe. Great. Thank you. Well, those uh, were really excellent results and very nice talk. And uh, we have to move on to our next talk now, which will be a recorded talk by um, Alexandra Mannings. Using high resolution imaging. So this study uh, utilizes um, imaging from the Hubble Space Telescope. Why do we use HST? Um, and that's because it provides a high resolution imaging. For example, in the infrared, we get a resolution of about 0.13 arc seconds per pixel, and for the UV, about 0.04 arc seconds uh, per pixel. And the Hubble also allows us to uh, get very deep imaging of these hosts. Um, so that we can study low surface brightness features that are otherwise um, not easily studied from ground-based imaging. Um, and these in conjunction with one another allow us to study the kiloparsec scale local environments um, around these FRBs. So here I'm showing an image uh, presented in Heinz 2020, which is a ground-based uh, VLT image of the host of FRB 191001. Um, and as you can see, there's a sort of you know hint of the extension of, of spiral arms and, and other features going towards the FRB localization, which is in the, the black circle there. Um, but with the sort of limit on the depth of the image as well as the, the resolution. Uh, we're not able to really get the best look at the, the local environment around this FRB. So that is why we use HST imaging. It really starts to bring out those low surface brightness features. Um, we see now sort of more of a, a full picture of kind of the, the radius of the host as well as the spiral features, all of that stuff. So we get a bit more insight into that, that local environment or the, the kiloparsec scale environments. So I'm just going to quickly kind of scroll through all of the images um, that we, we presented in this study. Um, on the left, you'll see the UV images, and on the right are the infrared images. Um, we, this sample included eight hosts, six of which were newly imaged, which are the ones that I'm showing you now, and then two uh, were previously uh, published hosts of 12.1102 and 1809.16. So first we take a look at the uh, morphology of the hosts. We use a uh, gal fit to fit uh, two CIRSIG models to the, uh, to the host light. 
and then we subtract those models off and we get residual images. So here I'm showing the original images and then here are the residuals. And this allows us to get a better look at the low surface brightness features, at the morphology of the hosts. Um, and in this, we're able to see that five of the eight hosts in this sample show a spiral structure. And not only that, but the FRBs appear on or very near to the spiral arms. And this was a very uh, exciting result for us to, to come upon. And we actually got a little bit of uh, press for this. This uh, image was processed uh, really nicely by someone at Alyssa Pagan at a Space Telescope. And here you can really see the, the uh, spiral structure really jumping out in those residual images and then the, the localizations of the FRBs too. So that uh, was very exciting. <laughs> We also take a look at the radial offsets of the FRBs. So what is the distance between the, you know, the center of the galaxy and the FRB localization? Um, we uh, set up a 2D uh, Gaussian uh, PDF along uh, the semi-major and semi-minor axes of the localization. And we take a weighted average um, as our, our offset uh, measurement. So here, just showing the that value in arc seconds, in physical units of kiloparsecs, um, as well as the effective um, or a host normalized offset, which allows us to, to normalize across different uh, host sizes. So showing two different examples here, one 19608, which you've also seen um, in Chatiti et al, and uh, 190714. This has a bit uh, higher offset, whereas this localization uh, overlaps a bit with the center of the galaxy and then uh, also goes a bit to the edge. So we um, plot a CDF of all of the measured values. The gray region here is um, a bootstrap estimated RMS. So we take into account the size of the, the sample size as well as the, the error on the individual measurements. And we plot this CDF um, in comparison as you saw uh, similar to um, Shivani's paper as well as Casper, um, plot this in uh, relation to other transients. So we look at gamma ray bursts and different types of supernovae. So the median value for our offset is about 3.2 kiloparsecs and um, with testing the null hypothesis that they're coming from the same underlying population, we uh, reject um, long gamma ray bursts and superluminous supernovae uh, based off of the, the KS test. Um, we also take a look at the host normalized offset uh, CDF, the median for this being 0.9 effective radii. Um, and with this, we reject the um, calcium rich uh, transients um, and once again, uh, long duration gamma ray bursts. Um, so the offsets we seem to be getting are pretty uh, moderate uh, across all of these FRB and their, and their hosts. We also take a look at fractional flux, which is a measurement that sort of looks at the, the brightness of, of the pixel where the FRB is originating from uh, in relation to the, the flux of the entire host. So these values are kind of like percentiles, or at least that's how I like to think about them. Um, where is this pixel testing uh, in, in reference to the, the sort of brightness uh, of, of the other pixels? So. Uh, this 0.39, just meaning that 39% of the host light is in pixels uh, fainter than this pixel. And again, we use the same uh, 2D Gaussian weighting scheme and take the weighted average to be our fractional flux value. So again, doing the same um, CDF um, and KS testing um, and this one-to-one -one line um, pretty much just says anything that, that follows that one-to-one -one line follows the uh, stellar mass 
in the in the host uh, galaxies. And so we see type 1a supernovae and core collapse supernovae uh, following pretty closely to that one to one line. And then again, based off of the KS testing, um, we reject uh, short gamma ray bursts and long duration gamma ray bursts. We know that short gamma ray bursts come from very, very faint uh, or pretty faint regions of their hosts, whereas uh, long gamma ray bursts are uh, concentrated to, to the brightest regions of their hosts. And, and uh, in this sample, we don't really see um, um, FRBs being in either really bright or the most uh, faint regions of their hosts. Okay, um, and then again, sort of along those same lines of uh, tracing the, the stellar mass, we uh, look at the fraction of light enclosed. We do some isophoto fitting to the, to the host galaxy and the isophote that's closest to the uh, radius or the offset of the um, FRB. We measure how much light is enclosed within that circle versus the entire sort of flux of the galaxy. Um, and we find that this distribution is consistent with the radial distribution of stellar mass, as you can see, sort of uh, we're pretty closely tracing that one to one line as well. And yeah, I guess I may not have specified, but the fractional flux uh, CDF that we were looking at before was infrared light. So looking at the stellar mass distribution and here also looking at infrared flux. We also take a look at um, the local versus galactic environment in terms of stellar mass and star formation rate surface density, um, local values versus the, the global values. And uh, here we're looking at the stellar mass surface density, this one-to-one -one line, um, just saying that the, the local value is not you know, elevated uh, in, in, in reference to the, the global or host value. And many of, or pretty much all of the hosts in this sample um, are close to or along this one-to-one -one line. And we also plotted a um, uh, average value for Milky Way giant molecular clouds uh, as reference. And then taking a look at the star formation rate surface density, um, many of these points were upper limits uh, that we could place using the, the um, UV imaging that we got from HST. And many of these upper limits are very near or close to uh, this one-to-one -one line. And then again, for reference, we plot some uh, values for um, star forming clouds here in the Milky Way, the lupus clouds and Perseus, which you can see are very elevated um, in comparison to the, to the global uh, host value. And then same for 121102, we know that this FRB uh, originates from a region of elevated star formation uh, in its host galaxy. And so it's it's well above this one-to-one -one line. But for these others, we don't we don't really see this uh, elevated star formation rate surface density. Three minutes, Alexandra. Okay, thank you. And then finally, we place uh, luminosity limits on, I guess, two different things. The first is whether or not there is some uh, satellite galaxy at the same redshift as the, the putative host that we've associated this FRB to. And those limits you can see um, as the upside down triangles. And uh, we use the luminosity of FRB 121102 as a reference point um, because we don't really expect these FRBs to be originating from anything fainter than that host of, of 121102. And then uh, based off of the dispersion measure of the FRBs, we're able to sort of uh, extrapolate out towards uh, to higher redshifts of a possible background galaxy or something that's not apparent in the image. Um, and we're able to place a luminosity limit on, on a possible uh, host at a higher redshift. And again, this, are, this is shown uh, as the diamonds. And many of these points are uh, below that luminosity uh, limit that we've sort of placed at uh, the luminosity of 
uh, the host of FRB 1211.02, except for these two 1910.01 and 1907.14. But again, we don't really uh, expect these FRBs to be hosted in uh, galaxies that are, are you know, much fainter than 1211.02. So we think that it's unlikely that the FRB is coming from some satellite or a background galaxy that is not apparent in these images. And this is just an, an image of, of 1211.02 as reference um, that again, it's, it's a pretty uh, faint host. So some takeaways. Um, we're here, we conducted the first population study of FRB host galaxies using a Hubble Space Telescope. We found that the FRBs were moderately offset from the host centers. We also saw that the sample of FRBs did not favor areas of particularly elevated or decreased stellar mass, um, nor um, star formation rate. Five out of the eight hosts show apparent spiral structure. And lastly, that it is uh, unlikely that there is a background or a satellite source that is the, the true FRB host. And I can take questions now. Great, let's thank Alexa. Uh, very interesting talk. So Alexa's not here to answer questions, but um, if you have any questions, we can try to field them perhaps to Shivani or um, members of the audience from uh, who might be able to answer. Maybe just a minute. To maybe just a quick question since I can uh, unmute. Um, so so I couldn't quite catch, are, are there any examples, and I guess one needs a fairly nearby galaxy to do this, where we really firmly know that the FRB is is really right at the peak of, of, of local star formation? Because it seems so far that we're always see, seeing small offsets in the cases where we can establish. Uh, yeah, so I think from uh, Alexa's talk, uh, it's clear that FRBs are not coming from the elevated regions, even though if they even if they are in the star forming galaxies, but the regions that they are coming from are not very star forming. So as you said, they are offset. So I think that's the point um, she also made in her talk. Yeah, I was just wondering, are there any exceptions though? Uh, exceptions. Um... And not in, I think not in the five of the um, eight hosts that she has showed, but for, but then for the other two hosts, the localization is not like very precise as, as those five hosts. So we can't really say anything about because it's not um, sub, sub arc seconds, it's still arc second localization. Great, thank you, Shivani. Matthew Bales, just as a comment, he says, beautiful images of the host galaxies. I agree. All right, so if there are no further questions, uh, let's on, move on to our next recorded talk. Uh, our next recorded talk is by uh, Wen Ben Liu. And we can play it now. I'm going to talk about this very interesting global cluster hosting uh, FRB, which is which came from these observations. I won't have time to go into the de detail of the introduction. So hopefully people already know that there is this FRB repeater in uh, in a global cluster, which is at offset distance about projected distance of about 20 kiloparsecs away from M81, which is at 3.6 megaparsecs from us. So here's an outline of the talk. I'm going to talk about the implication, meaning the theoretical implication on the lifetime and energetics and formation pathway of the object and, and the emission mechanism. If I have time, I'll go through the FRB population. So the, there is a very, very simple argument on the active lifetime of this source. Here's the argument. So the total number of neutron stars 
in the M81 light galaxy is about 10 to the 5. There's not much more than that in the galaxy. And in the most optimistic case, where you assume all neutron stars in globular clusters are capable of emitting FRBs in their, in their lifetime of 10 giga years in the past, here's the fraction of that 10 giga years that is active. So that's the fraction of the total source that are, that are active. And taking into account Poisson fluctuations, there's at least 0.1 uh, such active sources at present day. And that gives you a very conservative lower limit on the, on the active lifetime of the source. So you can immediately say that this source is not a typical galactic soft gamma ray repeater. It's much older than that. So the next thing is on the energetics. We know the, the isotropic luminosity. So this, this is a luminosity, not the luminosity of FRB, but you taking into account all the bursts that were detected within the exposure time and then isotropy equivalent to that. And that you get something, it's a very small luminosity. It's not like a you know, very, very bright source in terms of uh, radio emission. And from that and from the lifetime, and also one has to make assumption on the emission efficiency, uh, one gets the energy budget of the system. So the system must have 10 to the 43 ergs or more uh, in order to generate FRBs for such a long time, tau here. So here I'm taking a very, very conservative radio efficiency of 10 to minus three shown over here. For comparison, the galactic FRB had radio efficiency. This is over all emissions. So most of the energy is really emitted in the X-ray band uh, for the galactic SGR. Uh, whereas I'm taking 10 to minus three as a very conservative limit, which gives the lower limit on the magnetic field strength. So it has to be 10 to the 13 Gauss or more. Another observational uh, limit from the X-ray, from Chandra X-ray ob observation, limits the spin down luminosity of the system because of a non-detection of X-ray, uh, limits the spin down luminosity to be less than 10 to the 39. It's not the most young and powerful millisecond magnetar that is ruled out. And this also disfavors supergiant power models as advocated by these authors. So putting in a PP dot diagram, here is what are the what, are, what are the constraints are. So this is the uh, the showing in purple is the X-ray upper limit. So mo the, the most uh, rapidly spinning down objects are ruled out. And here is the H showing in brown. So the 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 youngest things are ruled out. And here is the B field strength. Uh, we're saying so only in this region, which is consistent with some old ish, as you know, some of the SGR, some of the magnetars are over here. I think the source is consistent with one of these kind of old ish, but slightly lower magnetic field magnetars. And uh, there is also an upper limit on the age of the system that is given by the magnetic field decay, given by the ambipolar diffusion. I won't have time to go into the detail how this is exactly calculated. You can go to this paper. Uh, by Peter Goldreich and Reisenegger. So here's the ambipolar diffusion lifetime. Uh, after this time, basically the interior neutron star, the B fields in the neutron star core is dissipated. And here are some uncertain parameters. This is the length scale over which the variation of the B field occurs, which is luminized to about one kilometer in size. And here's the temperature. So you can see there's a strong dependence on the temperature of the neutron star core. So as the neutron star cools as a function of time, uh, the ambipolar diffusion time becomes shorter and shorter. So roughly speaking, about 10 to the five years is about the time when the neutron star core cools enough such that there is no more, uh, such that there is no more interior uh, magnetic energy. So that one can, one can work that out, get the lifetime of the, of the neutron star function as a function of the interior magnetic fields. You can see that given some uncertainty over here, the maximum lifetime, if the system, if the FRBs are magnetic power is about 1 million years. Uh, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is the formation pathway. How is such a neutron star formed in a globular cluster? This has also been talked about by Kyle Kramer. Uh, so this very simple argument. So it's the, uh, the number density of such sources in the universe which can be obtained because we know the nearest object of a given class, uh, assuming homogeneous distribution in a universe. Here's the cumulative distribution of number density of such sources, given the, the enclosed volume of the nearest object. Here's M81 FRB. For comparison, I'm also showing R3, which is one of the most active sources on the sky. 
this is at much larger distance of 150 megaparsec. This one is about uh, four megaparsecs. And uh, so you can see that this is, these sources are quite abundant in the universe. Roughly speaking, there is one per Milky Way like galaxy. Uh, a curious fact that is this the number density ratio of the two things. We also have the mean luminosity, time average luminosity ratio of this thing. And you find that the product of these two is comparable. It's just a fun fact. Um, so in terms of formation pathway of the M81 FRB, here I'm showing, uh, it's very simple. So you have the number density, which is constrained by observation. And we also have some constraint on the lifetime. So that constrained the formation, the birth rate. And that gives some hint about the formation pathway. Here's what's allowed by observation. Here's the lifetime. It's, it's been between 10 to the four and 10 to the six years. I would say most likely it's 10 to the five years. So the, for, the birth rate of, the, of, the, of these objects are in this range. They're not you know, near the core collapse rate. They're much less than the core collapse rate. And, uh, and I found that this is consistent with, uh, uh, with one of the potential channels, which is the massive double white dwarf mergers which has been advocated by Kyle Kramer et al., which has this rate. You can see that it's allowed over here. That's shown over here. And I would say some double neutron, a tiny fraction of the double neutron star is maybe slightly, al maybe allowed, but it's uh, taking into account this is in the global cluster, I would say double neutron star merger is very unlikely. More likely it's a white dwarf, white dwarf mergers. So how does a, a massive white dwarf merger make neutron star? Here's the re most recent picture goes like this. After the merger, if detonation is, if this, the system does not detonate, then you have viscous, ev then uh, undergoing, the system undergoes viscous evolution and becomes a spherically, roughly spherical inflated red giant, hundreds of solar radii. And there's a very, high, very large uncertainty on the mass loss of the, such a red giant. If the remaining mass is more than a tenderosecar mass, then you get a neutron star. If less, then you get a massive magnetized white dwarf. Here's the most recent work done by Josiah Schwab. Uh, you, can, you can imagine this is the um, mass at merger. This is the final mass. Of course, there's uncertainty on the mass loss history. This is one of the fiducial values, but it can vary by an order of magnitude up and down. So the final fate is really unknown. You can, but you can see that it's, uh, it's possible that massive white dwarf mergers do make neutron stars. Uh, so uh, let me gonna skip this. If I have time, I'll come back to this. This is related to the formation pathway of R3, which many of you may also be very interested. R3, the number density is tiny. So the formation, the birth rate must be very small and the lifetime cannot be shorter than 10 years. So you can see that the, their formation rate is less than about 10 per gigawatt Q per year. So it's unclear what extremely rare type of stellar collapse made that. So going to the emission mechanism, so there is a near field and far away model as we discussed as we discussed earlier. There are all these references shown over here if people are interested. So the key constraint comes from the variability time. This is done by uh, Wallet at uh, all's observation. They found the variability time of one of the bursts from M81 FRB is shorter than their time resolution. So in the faraway model where you have an ejection from a neutron star or black hole going to very large distances R, and this ejection uh, drives a forward shock into the ambient medium. So the duration of the FRB is given by the, you know, just the causal, the causal connection time. Uh, and it's very, very difficult to achieve variability time much shorter than the FRB duration. That is because the observer sees the entire cone of one over gamma uh, contribution. And that smears, uh, smeared away all very short variability time that may occur on a very tiny volume. So a way out of this uh, variability time is you have propagation effects at much larger distances than where FRBs are generated. This is one of the uh, nonlinear uh, effects where the FR FRB pulse is very, it has a very high amplitude and that can break into fragments in both the longitudinal direction and transverse direction that can induce very short variability time. However, we have taken that model and looked into uh, uh, how such a, such a short variability time can be generated. This is what that model can give. So here I'm showing the variability time in log space over here. Here's one microsecond, one millisecond and longer. And here are the different constraints that we have. So 
at in the best case scenario, the system, this this scenario, the propagation scenario due to nonlinear propagation effects can give you variability time about 200 nanoseconds, which is much longer than what's observed or what's inferred to be less than that. So we think far away models are disfavored by the observations. So uh, I think I still have time to talk about FRB population, which is so nice. So um, uh, here I'm showing the FRB rate. Here is the cumulative rate, so a rate uh, per unit volume, per unit time, greater than some FRB energy. So the FRB energy is given by the fluence multiplied by four pi distance squared. And shown here are a couple of constraints. Here's the ASCAP. So ASCAP had their fly's eye survey, which was only sensitive to bursts brighter than 10 to the 31 Earth per hertz. So these are where ASCAP, ASCAP is very sensitive. And on the high energy side, ASCAP I know this small number statistic, then the error becomes large. So ASCAP did not have much constraint on the lower energy end, but you can extrapolate backwards. And you can show that the extrapolation actually are cons is consistent with the measurement from the M81 FRB, as well as the galactic FRB shown over here. And the whole, thing, uh, the whole FRB population is consistent with a single power law with the power index of the cumulative index of negative one. Here is what's, what, if you draw a line over here, that's what this line is. Um, thanks, I have one last slide. Yeah, so another thing I wanna introduce, the final thing I wanna introduce is the luminosity density. So how much energy is emitted by all FRB sources per unit volume, per unit time? Here is the per unit time shown here, you may not be seeing. So the answer is about a thousand solar luminosity per gigaparsec cube. So FRBs are not great at emitting energy at in injecting energy into the universe. So here are, what you get is because we know the number density of these sources and we know the mean luminosity of these sources. Here's what you get the luminosity density from these three classes. This is R3, uh, this is a M81 FRB, and this is a galactic FRB. You can see that roughly speaking in all these classes, of sources, they actually form uh, kind of a uniform injection, kind of a uniform distribution, despite their mean luminosity being very different. And another conclusion you can draw is that because this this type of this class of sources are come from uh, old stellar population, and you find that old stellar population population contributes at least a few percent of the total FRB luminosity density. Um, I have the summary slide. So the, here's the summary slide. Um, so uh, we found that this FR, M81 FRB source is consistent with the old neutron star, basically, but it has to be quite magnetized. It's a slowly spinning, and it's most likely formed from double white dwarf mergers with total mass exceeding the Chandra sector mass. And the FRB emission mechanism is most likely with, from within the magnetosphere instead of far away. And we think old stellar population contributes of at least a few percent of the FRB rate. So people should target those, you know, old stellar population like galaxy cluster and bigger, big and, and big galaxies. And here are the other things. Thanks so much. Great. Let's think when Ben. So I don't see when Ben on the call, nor um, nor any of the co-authors on this paper. Um, so if you have any questions, and I see a couple already in the Q&A, uh, please type them in in the Slack channel, and I'm sure Wenbin uh, or any of uh, the collaborators on this work would be very happy to take them when they're awake and online. So um, with that, let's move on to our next recorded talk. Um, this will be a talk by Wenfei Fong. Will tell us about the dusty star forming coast uh, in arc second localization of the re remarkable repeating FRB 20, uh, 2011 24A. All right. I said my name is Wenfei Fong. Um, I'm at Northwestern University and I'm new to the field of FRBs, but coming from the world of gamma ray bursts, this is extremely exciting uh, to be a part of, and I see a lot of similarities uh, with that field, particularly in the early days, but a lot of differences too that are very exciting. Um, and it's just been such an interesting conference so far. I've learned a lot. Um, so today I'll talk about the uh, remarkable repeating fast radio burst 2020-11-24A uh, and its environment. I know uh, many of you are very familiar with this burst, having been involved in campaigns around the world uh, to localize and uh, catch this burst in action. 
And uh, this particular paper that we submitted a couple of uh, like six weeks ago was um, in collaboration with uh, a large group, in particular the Fast and Fortunate FRB follow-up collaboration and CRAFT. And I just wanted to highlight the numerous PhD students and postdocs also involved in this effort. Um, it's one of the things I love about FRBs too, is I've noticed how um, these young, uh, young students and postdocs get elevated platforms when it comes to scientific, scientific discovery, which is excellent. Um, I also want to note that there are two other great papers, uh, at least, maybe I missed, missed one in the last 24 hours, but that came out on the archive uh, with some focus on the host galaxy. So I urge you also to check out those really nice papers and I'll highlight some relevant results um, here too. Okay, so I know we're kind of mid session, so I want to do a little bit of an icebreaker to to wake you up, uh, but really this is, I promise this comparison uh, between this fast radio burst and my nephew is relevant. So uh, this is a picture of my nephew, if you haven't guessed. Uh, for one, both were born or discovered on November 24th, 2020. This is a really special um, and exciting fast radio burst for me to study. Um, I didn't actually get to meet him until just last week when he was eight months old. And I was also happy to learn that both uh, this fast radio burst and that my nephew are prone to outbursts of activity with absolutely no warning. Um, I've, I know that the fast radio burst has you know, undergone a period of silence since uh, late May. That's not the same for my nephew. So that's one uh, difference. Uh, and both, this is kind of a stretch, but uh, both have fondness for color, as you can see in this uh, picture of him, and uh, fondness for the full EM spectrum, as you'll see throughout the talk. All right, so on to science. Um, so this is a timeline of FRB 2011-24A. I just wanted to kind of put everything into context. I know we've had several talks on this um, uh, burst, but this is just to kind of uh, give, a, give a full view this is the first talk on it in a, in a little bit, a couple of days. Uh, so this, the CHIME FRB collaboration discovered this on November 24th of last year. Um, about four months later, they announced a period of high activity and they were absolutely right. So this FRB kind of went like gangbusters uh, as part of, the, with, in conjunction with the ASCAP craft collaboration, uh, we detected the FRB and follow-up searches and provided an arc second localization, and thus a host identification that landed right on a, a host galaxy. Meanwhile, uh, FAST also was detecting 100 FRBs at the same time, which is amazing and crazy at the same time. Uh, the UGMRT was also performing follow-up a few days later, and uh, they detected FRBs as well as persistent radio emission, which was interesting we obtained an MMT spectrum of the host galaxy just a few days later to nail the redshift down to a fairly local redshift of 0.098. Meanwhile, uh, the VLA real fast team swept into action and uh, localized the FRB. Uh, and then further results from the VLA also confirmed the presence of persistent radio emission at gigahertz frequencies. And then uh, the EVN chimed in, and no pun intended, chimed in, um, and uh, also found that uh, found the FRB pinpointed it to milliarc second precision, which again uh, solidified the host galaxy association and the uh, persistent emission. They found uh, they did not find evidence of persistent radio emission in their imaging, and so thereby. Uh, uh, saying that this was resolved out and probably not compact. So placing a lower limit on the size scale of a couple of hundred parsecs. Uh, meanwhile, Stockert, which I hear is was a breakthrough uh, for this facility, detected an extremely bright FRB um, in between this action, which was uh, momentous for them. And there was also further follow-up by Ansala and the Allen Telescope Array. Uh, and meanwhile, Chime was detecting this thing uh, throughout the entire period. There was a a break in between, but it was covered by many other radio facilities. Um, and I think the last activity, according to the website, was late May. So just to put this into context, this is an extraordinary global and rapid follow-up effort. I think this is a great test of independent localizations from many different teams. Um, this also, I think, highlights the importance of really rapid communication, uh, which I'm sure you, you all are aware as you all participated in that. Um, and that really helped us try to identify the host extremely quickly. 
uh, the persistent radio mission we found was not, uh, the community found, was not a true compact persistent radio source. Uh, there's been greater than 200 bursts reported to date. I'm sure there's many more lurking in data sets and campaigns are still ongoing. So this is a really um, extraordinary, uh, remarkable event to study. Okay, so I'll focus a bit on the ASCAP localization and uh, observations of this source. So these are the three bursts that were used for localization. There were actually 11 ASCAP bursts detected in total. Uh, three are available for uh, with downloaded voltages where we can actually use the localization information. And uh, we detected it in both the mid band and the high band at a variety of fluences. And the DM was consistent with other DMs reported around 412 to 414. Um, and the paper, papers are in the works for uh, the details of the remaining uh, eight bursts that we don't present here. In terms of localization, I just wanna kind of give you a lay of the land and I'm gonna split this on the left-hand side into the FRB localizations on the right-hand side into the host or radio emission localizations because it's too much to put on one plot. Um, so this is archival PanStars imaging, it provides a pretty nice view of the host and the host center is marked with a yellow X. Um, here are the ASCAP localizations. So each of the purple dashed lines represent uh, one sigma localization of an ASCAP burst. And then the joint position um, performing a um, pro joint probability map, we get one and two sigma contours uh, in pink. Uh, and as I said, EVN also nailed the position of this burst and we can see that we're fully consistent with their pinpointed location. So going on the right, this is the same exact uh, field of view, but there were two, I just wanted to point out different positions. So now this is really focusing on the host galaxy. And so overlaid are the VLA and UGMRT persistent radio emission, the extended persistent radio emission um, uh, localizations. You can see they're fairly consistent with the host galaxy center and also marginally consistent with the FRB localization. And just a couple of nights ago, there was a detection of uh, the paper that said a detection of the VLA uh, host at 22 gigahertz. And uh, just trying to um, pull the coordinates from that paper and put it on, uh, this is where they fall. You can see it's more co-located with the FRB localization, but maybe marginally consistent with the host center. Uh, so for sure, it seems like this uh, host radio emission is kind of bobbling around not in reality, but just um, as we improve our localization. Uh, okay, so this is our MMT spectrum uh, where we were able to obtain the redshift and this placed the host at a redshift of 0 0.0979 plus or minus 0 0.0001. And um, you can see the detection of several emission lines. Uh, curiously, our, our uh, spectrum was so high signal that we were actually able to pinpoint some mysterious un unidentified uh, lines initially uh, at this redshift, uh, but I always say spectroscopy is truth that really um, can tell us way more than imaging can, and we actually associate this uh, to a background galaxy at a half arc second offset that really happens to be uh, there by chance, and we can rule out this redshift to fairly high confidence based on the um, burst dispersion measure. Uh, so using the emission lines, we can actually uh, place this on a BPT diagram to understand where it is with respect to AGN versus st classic star forming galaxies. Uh, this is from Shivani's paper and she showed this plot, but I'll just show it again, uh, that it really is uh, identified as a classic star forming galaxy uh, with a moderate star formation rate of 2.1 solar masses per year from H alpha. So we undertake a full modeling of the host galaxy with Prospector. This is the one slide that I'll kind of uh, geek out a little bit on um, on modeling stellar population modeling techniques because I think um, I just want to highlight a couple of things that we're doing uh, differently from from uh, the current transient community. Um, and so this is a, a 12 filter plus a spectrum fit uh, with Prospector, and we undertake uh, nested sampling with Dynasty versus MCMC. So that actually has the advantage of not. Uh, being as sensitive to your priors and not falling into um, uh, solutions that may or may not be real. Uh, we also perform joint fitting of the photometry and spectroscopy to use the full power of the data set as there's a lot of information encoded in the spectrum itself. 
We employ non-parametric star formation histories, meaning we're agnostic essentially to what, uh, how the stars were being formed over time. And that's really important um, in terms of understanding other stellar population properties correctly. And then we also use mass weighted ages. So I could go on forever about ages, but um, they're a really difficult thing to pinpoint. Uh, but many of the uh, ages you'll see in the literature in general are based on simple stellar populations or light weighted ages. And those are generally biased toward where the light is from more massive stars and will uh, be biased toward younger ages. So uh, the mass weight ages that you'll see coming from our works are generally older um, than those light weighted ages but are a bit more um, uh, reliable in terms of understanding when a progenitor could have formed and that kind of thing. Uh, and just to show you how well our model does with the uh, spectroscopic fit, this is just a zoomed in uh, version of the prospector model with our MMT spectrum. And you can see almost every believable bump and wiggle we are able to fit very well. Three okay. minutes. What? Three minutes. Okay, thank you. All right, so this is the um, upshot. So this is the uh, stellar population properties. In other words, it's a fairly uh, you know normal star forming galaxy, moderately dusty. Um, some things of note, it's of subsolar metallicity, which is kind of interesting. Um, and there might be a, a hot dust component contributing to the mid infrared luminosity. Uh, another thing that we're able to reconstruct is the star formation history. It's remarkably constant over its 10 giga year history. Uh, and so just in case you're not used to looking at plots versus look back time, uh, T look back of zero is the time at the FRB redshift. And then you go back in time as you go uh, leftward on the X axis. And so this is just a fairly constant star formation history. It drops in the past 30 million years or so, uh, but it, there's no real evidence of starburst activity or anything that could be potentially associated with such an active repeating FRB. And just um, as an example, this is just purely for context, nothing to do with FRBs, uh, but the host galaxy of GW72817, which was a binary neutron star merger, had a rapidly declining uh, uh, star formation history, just to give you context for the diversity of star formation histories that exist out there. And of course, this is a very old um, uh, host with a long delay time. So this is just for contrast. Uh, we can also construct the mass buildup history to understand over the course of the galaxy's lifetime um, when, when mass was built up. So this is basically saying if the progenitor purely traced stellar mass in the host galaxy, it's likely greater than a few giga years old. Of course, we um, have heard that uh, from previous talks probably that there's more uh, to repeating FRBs than just stellar mass. For the broadband view, we can confirm that the continuum radio emission is from star formation. So this is from Vikram Ravi's paper, and I know there's um, other contributions from ATELS in this, where it showed that this basically follows a power law or a broken power law. Uh, putting the entire broadband SED together, we see that the, uh, that the radio emission agrees very well with a new to the minus 0.75 classic star formation power law and connects really well with the rest of the available data. And uh, we can fairly solidly rule out uh, a strong AGN contribution. Um, so this is one of the first repeating FRBs with detected host star formation in the radio bands. I think M81 might be the only other one that has the advantage of being uh, very close by. Um, we can also set some sort of size scale uh, based on the available measurements in the literature. And this implies a size scale of less than the galaxy. And so at first we thought this might be due to some circumnuclear uh, star formation activity. But recent work just posted a couple of days in the archive suggests that maybe uh, at least at 22 gigahertz, this uh, potential radio emission or star formation activity might be more co-located with the FRB uh, site than we expect. And so that's uh, very interesting and clearly highly sensitive, um, resolu high resolution sensitive imaging in the radio and optical is needed to really delineate the true substructure and its relation to the FRB. Um, and just one last slide. Um, so I just want to end with uh, just a kind of uh, thought. Um, if is a compact PRS like um, those of 121102, and we just heard about 190520 possible, and so I grabbed all the available uh, data. And so this is just to put into context where the existing limits on such a PRS uh, for 21124A sit with respect to um, 
known PRSs. And so uh, this PRS would need to be greater than 20 times less luminous than known compact PRSs. But I think it's um, worth trying to uh, look at models and you know, understand that they're, um, and so under certain models, PRS luminosities can in fact be time variable and span orders of magnitude. Um, and so I think this is kind of an interesting possibility. Okay, um, I had a few more things, but I will just end with a couple of conclusions and leave it up and just advertising the VLT large program coming up that we've heard about. Um, all right, happy to take questions. Great. Well, let's thank Wenfei for the wonderful talk. So Wenfei isn't here to answer questions, but we do have uh, others, uh, other collaborators that perhaps are able to field questions. Um, perhaps Shivani or, um, or others that I see online. Um, so if you have any questions, please do type them out and we'll try to see if someone is willing to answer them. I like the FERBI acronym. All right, I'll wait one more minute for questions. Uh, if not, yeah, you can always type in questions on Slack later on if you remember something, and I'm sure one of they will be very happy to answer them when she wakes up. All right, so with that, let's move on to our next talk, which will be a live talk by uh, Fayan Wang. We'll tell us about the DM host and DMIGM of FRBs uh, derived from uh, the illustrious TNG simulation and their cosmological applications. All right, take it away. Thanks, Ben. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Fai Wang. My talk title is DM host and the DM my GM uh, derived from, der derived from uh, TNG simulations and their cosmological applications. This is a quick outline of my talk. First, I will introduce what are FRBs. Then I will show the results of DM host and DM my GM derived from uh, TNG simulations. And then the cosmological applications of them are shown. Last, I will give a summary. A fast burst was first discovered by Lorimer in 2007. Uh, they are further confirmed with a large sample uh, in, uh, after 2013. Uh, the striking feature of our FRB is that they are uh, frequency dependent arrival time. The time delay between two frequencies can be uh, described by this equation and is depend on the uh, dispersion measure, which is defined as a column density of free electrons in the line of sight. Uh, the dispersion, uh, dispersion measure of IGM combined with the rest of FRB is crucial for its cosmological applications. Uh, such as a missing baryon problem, dark energy, a realization, elastic structure, cosmic properties, hyperparameter, and hyper constant. However, the DMIGM cannot be obtained directly from motivations. The variance of DMIGM is large. How to model DMIGM is crucial. The observed uh, dispersion measure of FRBs uh, can be separated uh, several, uh, into several components, such as from the uh, host galaxy of the uh, FRB and the intellect, intergalactic IGM, also the halo of Milky Way, also the ISM of our Milky Way. For the Milky Way, we can use models to describe them. However, the DM IGM and the DM host from the reasons are correlated. Uh, how to uh, model them. In order to model the distributions of uh, DMRGM and DM host, we use the, the state of art, the illustrious TNG cosmological, uh, cosmological simulations. Uh, this simulation gives detailed distribution of particles, dark matter, star formation rates, metallicity, and elect. Three physical simulation box sizes are employed, such as 5100. 300 megaparsec side lens. 
The large dimension box can be used to study the large secret structure of the universe. For example, for IGM, for DMIGM, we use the TNG300, while the small dimension box can provide a better resolution of, of the galaxy. So for the DM host, we use the TNG100 simulation. Because in our work, uh, when, when our work is uh, was done, the TNG15 was the data of TNG13 was not released. Uh, below, we introduce the method to derive DM host. First, according to the observational properties of uh, the host galaxy of uh, uh, FRBs, such as the stellar mass and the star formation rate, we select galaxies that are similar to the host galaxy of localized FRBs. Uh, for the two repeating FRB, uh, the stellar mass of the host galaxy is dramatically different, so we consider them separately. For the non-repeating uh, FRBs, we treat them as a whole. Uh, the second one is to uh, determine the location of FRBs in the galaxy. For repeating FRBs, considering the magnetic origin of FRBs, uh, we, are, uh, we assume the probability of FRBs in your galaxy is proper, proper signal to the star formation rate. For non-repeating FRBs, uh, some have very large offset uh, from the localized ones we can, they are uh, far away from the galaxy center. Assuming uh, them for, are produced by mergers or by neutron star, uh, we can we calculate the locations or FRBs using binary stellar evolution code. Uh, our result can well explain the short GRB offset distribution. Also can produce large offsets of F FRBs. Uh, the third uh, is to, is to can calculate the electron number density NE from this equation. Uh, the parameters of this value are, are all given by the simulations. So last, we can uh, sum, uh, we can derive the DM host through this equation, sum uh, NE times dot L along a given, a given uh, that line. We select 1,000 galaxies similar to the observed one, uh, 500 FRBs in each galaxy. Uh, each FRB has 10 random directions. Uh, therefore, uh, we have totally 5, 5 million DM hosts and each shift from 0.1 to 1.5. Below, we saw our dot. For repeating FRBs, uh, the left is for the FRB type 1102, and the left, the right for the FRB 18096. Uh, the histogram uh, shows the DM distributions derived from, uh, derived from TNG simulation. And the red lines show the log normal function fits. The non log normal function is shown in this equation. Consideration is the observational uh, constraint on the host DM. Uh, in this three uh, panels, we show the DM. Uh, host distribution for non-repeating FRBs, they, are, they can also be well uh, fitted using the log normal distributions. The best fitting values are shown in this table. We also found that the DM host increase as the redshift increase. The evolution of the media value of DM host can be fitted using this equation, which is proportional to one plus d. Uh, the reason is that uh, we can from, see from this figure, the common ele free electron density uh, is almost independent of the redshift. Uh, but uh, we we can uh, the host we the observed DM host is the physical uh, density, not the common. We we are uh, convert the common density to the physical density, so the uh, DM host will increase with redshift. We also discussed the effect of galaxy selection, uh, selection uh, because uh, in about, uh, in, uh, in, uh, about we use the stellar mass in a wide range, for example, from one to 15 times 10 to uh, seven solar mass. Solar mass. Uh, 
uh, we also choose a narrow range for the stellar mass between uh, four to seven times 10 to seven solar mass. We, the histograms show the uh, result for uh, two cases. We can see that these two histograms are constant with each other. So our results is almost uh, independent of the galactic selection. Uh, below, we discuss the DMRGM from the TNG 300 distribution, uh, the simulation. A pre previous theoretical studies uh, treated the DMRGM uh, as uh, in a homogeneous universe. The uh, average value of DMRGM is so in this equation. However, the effect of RGM in homogeneity will cause fluctuations since of DMRGM. Uh, they have been derived from different cosmological sim simulations in the low red state. Uh, Eurotrus TNG has two advantages compared to previous simulation. First, it can provide the electron uh, density directly instead of converting from the dark matter particle number density to baryonic matter density. Second, uh, the Eurotrus TNG covers a wider red state range up to redshift nine. Uh, we introduced the method to derive DMIGM. Uh, first, we choose the line of sight is parallel to the x, uh, x axis. Uh, then we construct about 5,000 square uh, caps of side lens 200 per moon KBC in each same shot. Uh, then divide the PEPs into 10,000 beans. The distance between each beam uh, can be ca calculated. And then we take the average of electron density of 10,000 beams and put it into the right equation to obtain the uh, value of D, D, DM, <coughs> RGM divided by D. Then uh, turn the uh, 10 million DM RGM relations are built by randomly select DA. D, D, G, M, I, G, M, D, Z from uh, 1, 0 0.1 to 9, uh, sh uh, showing the dotted line. The dotted lines are the fits using, using a quartz gaussian uh, functions with a long tail. And the rest of the last the survey, we can the distributions of uh, DM, I, G, M are overlapped, indicating that our universe is do not reanalyze and high receipt. The DM uh, IGM can be well fitted uh, with a uh, uh, quartz Gaussian function with a long tail, so I show in this equation. The best fitting values and the different receipts uh, uh, are shown in this table. Uh, below, we show the DM IGM uh, relation. In the left figure, we show our best, uh, uh, our, our derived result as showing as the blue third line. and. Uh, See the region shows the 95 confined region. Uh, the uh, left panel shows the localized FRBs, uh, the DM, IGM, they release. And the rest of the one, however, uh, the DM, IGM is about uh, 900 plus uh, 700 minus uh, 300 PC per cubic centimeter. The, the uh, uncertainty is up to 18%. And uh, received one. So consider the awareness of DMRGM is very important. The first uh, cosmological applications is a reanalysis. Uh, in this figure, we show the green and the yellow lines are constraints on the reanalysis history from the cosmic macro background observed by Planck satellite using different priors. Uh, the red line, I'm showing the red line is our best. Uh, a reanalysis fits with the, re, uh, the re, reanalysis received about six from uh, the IGMDM derived from the TNG 300, which is consistent with the reanalysis model used in the TNG simulation. This is also support uh, that our derived the DM IGM is uh, robust. The second uh, uh, cosmological applications is uh, to measure the, cos uh, the cosmic macro background opt optical depth. Uh, the theory optical depth 
back to relative state uh, can be written uh, as the integral of the electron distance times the Thomson cross section along proper lengths. As so in this equation, uh, the yellow region is the Planck uh, 2015 observations uh, conjoints on the uh, optical optical depths of CMB, and the yellow region uh, is our a result from the TNG stimulations, we can see, and the 95% uh, confined regions, uh, they are consistent with each other. Uh, the third cosmological application is to measure the value of Hubble constant. Uh, this talk, uh, this uh, topic has been discussed in uh, this morning uh, section. Uh, first, the average DMRGM can be shown in this equation. Uh, from a bow analysis, we, we obtain the uh, DM host and the DMRGM uh, probability distributions uh, can be described with these two equations. Then the likelihood function uh, for the uh, hub constant can be described with this equation by uh, integrate the DMRGM with DM host from zero to the, the observed one. Uh, then from the 14 uh, localized FRBs, uh, we, obtained, uh, we obtained the uh, value of half constant about uh, 16.5 uh, with the precision about 8%. In this figure, we also show the uh, upper constant derived from the uh, CMB and the type 1A signal. We can see in the one sigma confined regions, our result is consistent with the same with the type with the value derived from the, the type 1A signal. Uh, for the gravitational waves, uh, such as the G, GW uh, 17O. 9, uh, 18. We can see there uh, it gives a very large uh, hub constant constraint. Uh, this is the la last slide of my talk. Uh, I will give a summary. Uh, the distributions of DM host can be well described by a log normal uh, function, and the media value of DM host uh, increase uh, with recipes. Uh, Third, that the DM uh, IGM can be well fitted by a cross Gaussian function with a long tail. Uh, they can be used to measure uh, uh, perceived recipe or non localized FRBs. For cosmological purpose, using the probability distributions of DM host and DM IGM is important. Thank you. Thank you, Fei, and thank you for this very interesting talk. So you already have a couple of questions. Um, so the first question uh, from Keegan Lee is, um, how did you determine the location of the FRBs within the galaxies? Randomly? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, the location of FRBs uh, we have discussed for repeating FRBs, uh, we considering the magnetic origin of FRBs, uh, they are mainly produced by the core collapse. So uh, therefore we assume that the probability of FRBs in the galaxy uh, is proper, uh, proper, uh, proper, uh, proportional to the star formation rate of the uh, site in the galaxy. For non-repeating FRBs, uh, because some have very large offsets, we assume them uh, uh, produced by the merge of a binary neutron star. So we use our uh, 2020 uh, 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 result as uh, <coughs> the distance from the galaxy center as use this uh, uh, red, uh, the dash red line, the location of our yeah. Thank you. All right, and then we have one additional question uh, from Ray Lu. Uh, it seems that the observed host DMs of current localized FRBs are quite different from the mean value 
uh, of the log normal distribution from illustrious TNG simulations, especially for repeaters. How do you explain the inconsistencies? What does that mean? Does that mean we should be very cautious when using the simulation results to do cosmology? Okay. Uh, yeah, the observational value for uh, for the first uh, repeaters at FRB 121102, we can see the media value uh, with uh, our, our uh, the DM host from simulations is far from the observable one because we don't con we do not consider that the uh, local contribution to the DM host uh, because for the for this FRB. Uh, the uh, the rotation measure is very large, so which uh, indicated uh, in the local DM maybe have a large a large value. So minus this uh, uh, with the observed uh, one minus the uh, local one, we can be be made constant. For the the second uh, repeater, uh, localized repeater, we can see the uh, observed. Value is consistent with our simulations one because this is uh, this value uh, this uh, this repeater the DM host contribution is very small and uh, the rotation uh, rotation measure is also about one hundred uh, uh, so results are consistent with the observed uh, value for the second localized repeater. All right, thank you. Well, with that, we'll move on to our final talk of uh, this evening session or morning, wherever you are. Uh, so we'll have a recorded talk by Liam Connor uh, telling us about Megajansky Galactic Bursts in a Megasource survey. About searching for FRBs on large field of view surveys. So I'm gonna start by talking about GREX searching for more Megajansky bursts, like the one that we, we detected from SDR 1935 last year. Um, and then I'll imagine what it might look like if we try to search a steradian field of view, like what GREX will have, um, but with approximately the sensitivity of GPT or even better. So we all remember the excitement last year in, uh, in April when a magnetar in our own galaxy, SDR 1935 plus 21, emitted this extremely bright, very energetic uh, burst, which was detected both by STAIR-2, which you can see in the bottom left here, uh, and by CHIME FRB in the side lobes. Um, and this was hugely informative. Of course, it, it created this dramatic link between the extragalactic FRBs that we've been studying for the past 10 years and magnetars in our own galaxy. So it's, it's natural to try to create another experiment, um, maybe with more sensitivity, more sky coverage, more, more exposure to the galactic plane, the southern sky, um, to search for more of these things, kind of acting as a radio uh, all sky monitor, analogous to how in the X-ray there are wide and shallow uh, X-ray surveys that, that really complement the smaller field of view, but more sensitive uh, X-ray telescopes. So the point of GREX, the Galactic Radio Explorer, sort of a rebranded STAIR-3 uh, is to find more of these galactic FRBs to search for supergiant pulses from pulsars in the Milky Way. Uh, we're going to be running a blind, roughly 10 microsecond search, which I can describe a little bit more in a couple of slides. Um, fast solar physics, and then of course, unknown unknowns when, when you search this kind of new parameter space with an enormous field of view. So this is the basic idea. Each, each GREX uh, cluster will be made up of three antennas. So there's no dish, it's just antennas pointed at the sky like with STAIR-2. And then we'll deploy these, these three antenna clusters around the world. And within those clusters, the, the antennas are separated by roughly a horizon scale so as to discriminate RFI. Um, and by placing them around the world, we might need uh, eight or so of these clusters and you can build up exposure to the full sky, such that you have continuous four pi steradian coverage. So uh, this is going to be about five times larger frequency, uh, frequency band than STAIR-2. It's going to be an ultra wideband feed, so between 0 0.7 and 2 gigahertz. Uh, we're going to capitalize on the very low noise electronics that have been developed for the DSA, which Vikram talked about yesterday. Um, and so we'll be sensitive to roughly 100 kilojansky bursts 
with a millisecond duration, maybe a little bit lower. And for the top quarter of our band, we're going to be searching uh, down to roughly 10 microseconds. Um, so as I mentioned, we're, we're using these ultra low noise electronics uh, developed primarily by Sandy Weinreb here at Caltech. And now with the help of his graduate student, Kieran Shila. And these have really great performance. They're, they're uh, roughly eight or nine Kelvin uh, over most of the band. And we're also going to be using the ultra wideband receivers developed by Jonas Flieger at uh, Onsela in Sweden. And he's, he's created these for DSA 2000. So again, this, this is really piggybacking on um, some really low noise and high performance uh, instrumentation that's been built for these two projects, DSA 110, which has about half of its antennas now, and DSA 2000, which is still in the design phase. Okay, so we, we talked in last week's discussion session about the value of searching for uh, the high time resolution data but uh, just how difficult it was. So Kendrick pointed out that you kind of get hit twice with this N squared effect, where if you want to increase your sampling time by, for example, a factor of 10, you'll probably become dominated by DM smearing, and therefore you have to have uh, 10 times more frequency channels, or, and, and so you might have 100 times more data to deal with. So one way to get around this is just to search at higher frequencies. DM smearing is, of course, much worse at lower frequencies. Um, so our plan is to do a sort of customized uh, channelization scheme in firmware, probably designed and built by Jack Hickish, where the top quarter of our band will have the same number of channels as the bottom three quarters. And because smearing is, is uh, significantly um, less detrimental up there, uh, the smearing curve is, is a lot better in the top quarter than the bottom three quarters, as you can see from these curves, where I plotted uh, the smearing time scale in microseconds as a function of dispersion measure. So you can see for the gray curve, this is, this is where we expect to do our search for supergiant pulses from either from pulsars that we don't know emit supergiant pulses or from pulsars whose main, whose, whose regular radio emission is not pointed towards us. So discovering new pulsars in this manner. And you can see we're still in the sort of 10 to 15 microsecond regime uh, at a hundred or a few hundred DM units. So similar to uh, SGR 1935. And now, because we're going to be moving into the southern hemisphere, we're going to get a lot more um, exposure to the galactic plane and, and therefore the, the magnetars that roughly trace star formation. So here I'm just plotting the magnetar fraction that's in your beam, that's in one of the G-Rex clusters beam uh, at a given hour angle on the top and a given UTC on the bottom for four different locations. So in dark, dark blue is Western Australia, and then GMRT in India, Ovro in the Netherlands. And you can see when, when uh, you're in Western Australia, you really do have a lot more access to uh, the galaxy's magnetars. So you can do some fairly simple modeling and you can say, well, given we've got five times the bandwidth with G-Rex over stair two, given we have about three times lower system temperature, and we've got a lot more sky coverage, including more exposure to the galactic plane, uh, you can estimate even just based on the one detection, how many of these galactic, galactic FRBs we might expect to see per year. Um, and with these wide Poisson narrow bars, you, you get maybe two to 50 events. So even, even if Stair 2 and Chime were really lucky in detecting this one event, and it's super rare, you, you should still expect G-Rex to find a couple of these each year. Okay, so let me now switch gears um, and continue talking about a, a large field of view survey, but imagine uh, populating the, the G-Rex field of view with coherently formed beams uh, and building up sensitivity that's, that's a little bit better than chimes. So Vikram mentioned this yesterday, but if you look at all these really impressive telescopes that have done a lot of really uh, exciting FRB science, you'll notice none of them was actually built to find or study fast radio bursts. So chime has done amazing things in the FRB field and it was designed for cosmology. Uh, you know, ASCAP was designed long before craft existed, aperitif to arts, and so on and so on. The one exception being DSA 110. Um, but at this point, nobody's ever explicitly designed a survey whose goal is to, to maximize the number of FRBs per unit time, per unit dollar. So 
if you imagine a survey, maybe starting construction in a few years, uh, whose goal was just to find as many FRBs as possible, uh, designing a sort of mega source survey that could find of order 10 to the six fast radio bursts, how would you do it? Um, so one way to do this is to start with Chime. Chime sees about a thousand FRBs per year. It's got an SEFD of roughly 50 Janskys and a field of view of 200 square degrees. These are my numbers, by the way, so they could be off by tens of percents. Um, so one way to get a million FRBs is to have a hundred chimes observing for a decade, right? You would, you would move them, you'd have a hundred chimes all around the world pointing at different places on the sky, roughly 20,000 square degrees, approximately a hemisphere of exposure, and you would have 100K FRBs per year. Um, another thing you could do is you could make chime longer and skinnier. So rather than having a 20 meter cylinder, uh, it would be um, say four or five meters in the east-west direction. So now each cylinder has a, a field of view of about a thousand square degrees. And then it would be, it would have to be longer in proportion and maybe just for good measure, you would uh, double the collecting area such that the SEFD was 25 Janskis. Um, again, with eight long skinny chimes, we're at hundred K per year. Another thing you can do uh, really leaning into the field of view thing would be to do away with dishes altogether. Uh, and you would end up with something like what we see here, dense aperture arrays. So these already exist. You know, em Embrace was the first one, I think. Embrace is over 10 years old. It was developed in the Netherlands at Astron. And this is a, a dense aperture array uh, with 5,000 Vivaldi feeds packed together very, very tightly. It observes at one gigahertz. Um, on the top, you see an artist's impression of an aperture array uh, proposed for the SK core. Um, an issue with Embrace is that uh, first of all, at a gigahertz, you don't have much collecting area. You only have lambda squared collecting area per, uh, per radiometer. So that's only about 0.09 square meters uh, per antenna in that case. Um, another thing is Embrace does hierarchical analog beam forming. So you don't ever actually have access to the full field of view. But you know you could imagine stripping those electronics and, and doing it all digitally over the full field of view. Um, for an FRB survey, you probably want to be at lower frequencies so that you have more lambda squared power, more collecting area. So just to run through the numbers, how you would do this, um, remember the rate of detection for any survey is gonna be the field of view times the number of sources within that field of view greater than some minimum brightness. So field of view times the either flux density or signal to noise threshold raised to the source counts uh, power law index which I'm using, I'm assuming are Euclidean here, and I think that's actually a fairly safe, to, safe assumption. Okay, so if we're observing between 400 and 500 megahertz, uh, that's about half a square meter per, per antenna. And it turns out you need about 14,000 antennas to match Chime's 6,400 square meters of collecting area. So suppose we have the same field of view as GREX, 20 to 30 times Chime's field of view. So between one and one and a half star radians approximately, you can plug in the numbers and you find that to get 100,000 detections per year, this would be about 50,000 antennas. And I'm assuming by the way that, that we can uh, cut in half the system temperature compared to the chime uh, with, with improved ambient temperature electronics. So just, just to emphasize that I'm not trivializing this pretty incredible task, um, this is a grid of 220 by 220 antennas for 50,000 in total. Um, and for each of these antennas, you need to amplify and digitize and channelize and send all of that data uh, to a beam former where you're going to create 50,000 beams. And then, of course, you have to search in real time 50,000 beams, excise RFI, all that stuff. So this is a massive task. And if we minutes. Use... Thanks. And if we use uh, sort of current day technology for the front end and the, and the digital back end um, channelization and, and digitizing and such, um, we could end up spending over $1,000 per antenna, which would make this whole thing prohibitively expensive because then you would end up with just sampling the thing at, at 50 or $100 million. So if you could get the cost per antenna down to a order $100 uh, for again, the LNAs, the ADCs and the channelization, uh, then the, the budget is starting to look at least a little bit feasible. 
Um, one way to do this, uh, and by the way, I'm not an expert on this, but uh, I understand it's, it's starting to happen, is that you could put the uh, LNA, the ADC, and the channelizer all on the same card. So if you could cheaply manufacture these very specialized ASICs that do all of those things, and then you just pump the channelized voltage data to an FFT beamformer, uh, then you might be okay. And by the way, if you if you put these antennas on a regular grid, then you can FFT beamform, which is n log n and not n squared. And searching 50,000 beams, of course, is pretty daunting, but it really is only an order of magnitude um, more beams than what we search currently in real time at Apertif on uh, 2016 GPUs. And actually we'd probably, this would probably be done with lower uh, time resolution than what's done at Apertif. It's also worth noting that um, if you frame it like this, the, num the total number of sources as this integral of the rate over time and over the relevant regions of parameter space, R of lambda, so where lambda can be DM width, frequency, whatever, um, before Chime, actually before the first catalog was released, we really didn't know much about R of Lambda. And now that we have this first catalog and, and we're going to have thousands of FBs from Chime, we, we really understand this distribution, which means for any upcoming survey, you can really tune your search, tune the regions of parameter space that you're searching to maximize the number of detections. And you might be able to get a factor of two out of that, uh, which means you could decrease the number of antennas. Okay, a natural question before I wrap up is, do we actually need a million FRBs? At what point do, do we start running into diminishing returns? And I think the answer is, if we don't need a million, then we at least need a lot more than we currently have. Um, and we need them in a, in a large field of view, or at least with the same pointing for things like gravitational lensing. So it's worth noting that gravitational lensing by a massive galaxy, which could be very exciting for lots of reasons that I would encourage you to tune into Whaley's talk uh, later today. Um, it's a rare event and it's also it also leads to delays, time delays from the lensing event that are days to months long, which means if you're not always pointed at the same patch of the sky, you're probably going to miss the uh, lens copies of the FRB. And so if the if the optical depth out to redshift to half, uh, as shown here, is maybe five times 10 to the minus four or 10 to the minus three at most, you really need huge numbers of FRBs and you need an enormous field of view or to always be pointed at a celestial pole uh, to actually see anything. Um, and I think that's true. I think that's probably true for lots of the other really ambitious cosmological applications of FRB. I suspect that uh, to do any EOR stuff, you need a huge number to map out large scale structure, do the CGM, IGM, all these things. Um, having a few thousand per year is probably not enough. Okay, so let me just summarize by saying GREX, um, is going to be this very shallow but all sky monitor, which could find an order of magnitude more of the uh, FRB like bursts that STAIR 2 found. The first one will probably be deployed in, in the uh, Smoky Valley in Utah. Um, and then finally, very large N and very small D, taking that to its logical conclusion, could produce pretty enormous detection rates for fast radio bursts. Um, and if we start thinking about how we would actually do this technologically, uh, there could be huge returns. So I'll leave it at that and I would happily take questions. Great. Thank you, Liam, for that wonderful talk, the recorded talk. So I don't see Liam online and uh, I have not seen any collaborators online either. Uh, if someone is present online on the call and um, available to answer questions, please do let us know. Otherwise, um, otherwise I'll just post the questions to Slack. All right, so in that case, um, I see we have one question in the Q&A, and I'll just copy paste it to Slack. And if you do have any other questions that come up um, or you think about uh, soon, uh, do put them in the Slack channel. I'm sure Liam would be very happy to read them. Um, when it's morning time here in California. Uh, and with that, I think we can conclude the session. Thank you uh, for everyone who attended and especially thank you to all the speakers, uh, those that gave live talks and also the pre-recorded ones. Bye everyone.